Assalamu alaikum and good day, everyone. So we are here. Welcome to Tuesdays with Dr. T. This is the first time we are having so many experts in one platform, in one page and whatnot. So we have today all of the most important people that I have been in my in my you know network. I have been working with them. They are my peers. I love their work and respect them very, very much. We are here today to talk about virtual autism. Have you heard about that term or not? It might be the first time you are hearing. It might be something that is in the back of your mind or you heard someone else talking about it. So today we are here to talk about our point of view of what we think virtual autism is, whether it's a myth or it's a truth and everything in between that, okay? So welcome to all of you all. I am very, very honored to have all of you. Most of you are also coming in uh, very early in the morning or late at night, right? We are very, very honored for that. Okay, so let's start with your point of view and I will be using my screen and call up you guys, okay? So first of all, we are work, uh, we are gonna talk with Anna. She's from Sydney. We know her as Nourished Mom. Anna. Hello. Would you, would you introduce a little bit? Yeah, my name's um, Anna Gundry. I'm a clinical nutritionist, um, work mostly with children on the spectrum, but also ADHD or other behavioral disorders in clinic. In clinic. Wow, that's nice. Okay. Have you, through your work, came across this term, virtual autism? We and did spoke about that. Yeah, um, haven't um, heard about it that much, but I think it goes back to the point of discussing, you know, autism symptoms, what they are, you know, underlying factors, what really is autism, you know, is it something genetic? Is it just a behavior? Is it a diagnosis? You know, what it really is. And I guess virtual, I mean, I looked into it a little bit and, you know, there's a lot of talk about screen time being, you know, a theory of, you know, if it's virtual autism and that's an underlying sort of reason for that, which isn't necessarily a, a bad theory, but I think saying that it would be the only thing isn't necessarily, in my opinion, uh, the truth. I mean, obviously, it's an environmental trigger for sure. Yeah. And uh, definitely, you know, triggers dopamine and brain imbalance and all those things probably um, affects primitive reflexes as well. So I think it's, you know, not a bad thing to say that it would necessarily be, I don't know, I don't think we need to necessarily label it, you know. I think we like to put labels on things. And I think when yeah. we do that, it gets a little bit complicated. And maybe it goes back to the point that, and I know Rita, you've been talking about that a little bit, you know, autism symptoms and what it is. And, you know, if you take away the diagnosis, what's left and, you know, it's, it's an interesting topic for sure. Um, but I don't think it's like black and white either, either. Does that make sense? Nothing in, nothing in the world is actually. Yeah. Nothing in the world. Everything is 50 shades of gray. <laughs> yeah. And I think like if if there's, I mean, from one of my research is like, there was a lot of talk about screen time, which is a very important topic for sure. But, you know, it would be interesting if they could bring out all the other underlying, you know, things like gut imbalances or, you know, just deficiencies or toxicities and all those other things that we know also is a contributing factor to autism or autism symptoms, whatever you would like to say, you know, it's a, it's a discussion. So, um, yeah. What's your what's your thought, Darlene, about it? Yes. So me, when I looked up the term virtual autism, I had never heard of it. And the first thing I thought was, it's another way to deflect and distract us. Um, it's another way to get away from what is really going on and what is happening by distracting parents to feel that um, it's not real. What we're doing is not it's real. It's my mind. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I don't, I think it's a myth. Uh, um, I when I, I didn't even do any more digging because I immediately thought it's just a way to distract parents. So that's my view. <laughs> yeah. What about you, Rita? Yeah. So I was hesitant to be to talk about this. Um, that's good. <laughs> but you know, you um you welcomed me uh, to speak. So um just many um just a quick story to why I think the way I think. Um, okay. 
when uh, Jordan was diagnosed with autism, he was in a uh, treatment program run by the Ministry of Mental Health here in Ontario. And he had a team, uh, an OT, a speech therapist, ABA therapist, um, psychologist that were overseeing him. And when he was about to be discharged, um, the psychologist said to me that uh, so many kids were being diagnosed with autism, but they really weren't autistic. Um, that there is an underlining factor, there's something wrong, or, um, you know, whether the child's not meeting their milestones or not, and they go to the doctor, uh, because they want answers. And the doctors don't have answers for everything. Um, so they just label them with autism. Mm -hmm. I didn't understand that at the time. And, you know, his name was Dr. Factor. Uh, I've been trying to find him because um, I, I just really wanted to understand more about his thought process. Um, but he's since retired and he's here somewhere in Ontario. Um, but, you know, then, um, you know, helping Jordan um, get better, um, helping these other children. Um, I see so many kids that their parents say that they were diagnosed with autism. And I look at them and I say, they're not autistic. Uh, and they say, well, how do you know? And I said, like, maybe I think of it as old school, but for me, autism is, you know, a neurodevelopmental condition, you know, um, issues with social interaction, communication, behavior, and sensory, right? Um, when I hear parents, and no disrespect to anybody, when I hear parents say, um, you know, my child recovered um, because they were so-and-so, I say, chances are they weren't diagnosed correctly. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, that's, I'm not disputing that there's nothing wrong with the child or there aren't any imbalances, but now it seems everyone is diagnosed with autism. You know, yeah. one parent that I visited, you know, she goes, oh, my child's a picky eater, but, you know, he was diagnosed with autism, you know, he has speech issues, he's speech delayed, and, you know, she lived in the neighborhood, so I went to go see her, me and one of Jordan's teacher therapists that helps me from time to time, and just looking at the child, I said, he's, he's not autistic, I said, you can go back to get another evaluation, and chances are he's not going to be diagnosed with autism. Mm -hmm. uh, but then on the other hand, Jordan continues to be in these social programs because he literally needs to be taught how to interact or how to start a conversation, get into a conversation. And there was this one child there, you know, you know, joking around with the instructors. And I, and I said to the, one of the instructors, I, why is he here? And she said, oh, well, because, you know, he has a diagnosis of autism. I go, but there's nothing wrong with him. And she said, oh, well, he suffers anxiety. And I said, okay, I don't see anxiety being put in the bucket of autism. Yeah. So that's my thought process. Okay. The reason why we had, uh, you know, I told you like it would be really nice to have your point of view as well, because everybody's saying the same thing, then it's not very democratic. There should be for and there should be against. And we are all, uh, I would say, like adult enough, mature enough to have nice conversation and share our point of view and maybe come to a middle ground where yeah. everybody gets the best out of this, right? Yeah. So Natalie, my kind of bestie, what's your point of view? <laughs> well, when, <laughs> when I heard, heard this like term, I was like, okay, like I know a lot about screens especially because in lifestyle medicine, when you go and I took it in at well, Cornell, they don't focus on autism, but they focus on neurotypical women, especially, and the impact of screens on the young mind and how much anxiety, depression, and how much this can impact. But now saying that, even though I have all this knowledge, when I saw and read that, it kind of blew my mind because I was like, so then I started going back and I was like, okay, in our story, how much did screens impact my son? And I was like, okay. So I was starting to go through the process of like, okay, was there screens even then? 
because like I'm like kind of old school too because it's been a while so when my son went through his process screens were not a thing like you couldn't even look at YouTube that well on your phone you couldn't look at it on the you could only look at it on the computer and things like kids YouTube didn't even exist then and so I think that and I think about Instagram and I think about all of these terms that are coming out and back 10 years ago or eight years ago when we were going through the process there just wasn't that many screens but there were still kids being diagnosed like in huge amounts with autism so is it a factor does it impact GABA and does it definitely you know impact our endocrine system of course but it's just one like I I think it was um I, I'm gonna call you nourish moms because I know oh, yeah. <laughs> 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 That's the thing about social media. And um, yeah, it's one of those, it's one extra, you know, probable on the con- on the cancer list. It's another probable on if you have too much, it's probably not a good thing, but it's definitely would not be the leading cause. Now, because I do run, I don't know if, like you guys probably know, I run a screen less challenge. So that means I have to go and back up a lot of the things that I say in that challenge scientifically. And there are studies that are showing a lot of different, like, impacts of specific like before the age of three if you're exposed to a lot of screens yes you're going to see a difference in your there's a potential that you'll see a difference in your child's behavior and yes if you remove screens and that behavior becomes better amazing but would I term it virtual autism I think that that's not very fair Mm -hmm. But but to say that children who are seeing improvements are linked to virtual autism and that they all of a sudden can get better seems a little bit to me far-fetched, but if they do, by all means, I'm going to high five every parent that's working at removing screens. Yeah, (laughs) totally. My thoughts are, it's definitely an issue. It's definitely affecting the brain, but Mm -hmm. is it the reason that my son went through what he did? If people saw the life that we lived, when we had to, you know, relearn how to live in the kitchen, how to interact with the entire world around us, because lifestyle was not part of our, uh, like the same upbringing as most of us who have been through this, right, who have kind of overhauled our lifestyle completely. um, Mm -hmm. I think it's, it is a little bit of a, I don't want to call it a slap in the face, but it's a little bit of a slap in the face to say that all was not. I, I feel it every time. Every time somebody tells me, like, I think your son had virtual autism. That's why he's so much improved. And I was like, you know what? He still has his issues. He still has his issues. And like, for example, the other day I made a reel and I came up with the world saying that my son has dyslexia. So it's it goes with the territory. But so far that we have recovered so much of it or gained back or whatever the language is. I don't, I don't, at this point, I am not care, caring much about the language. I'm just, is it working? Is it improving my child's uh, capability of leading, a, you know, independent, successful life? I am all with it. You call it recovery, you call it curing, call whatever you want, but don't disrespect my hard work by saying like, oh, my son has, you know, virtual autism. Because you <laughs> see struggling and it's a process it's not a marathon you know sometimes some people still dms and say like can you cure autism i'm like not really because it would be like asking um you know like apple what's the guy's name i forgot he, he died the one who got the apple thing so it will be like asking him sorry what's his name no apple no, phone you know, not Bill Gates. No, not Bill Gates. <laughs> we all we've all been like drilled that Bill Gates is like always in the limelight, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so that, so it would be like asking him, like, oh, your Apple is actually uh, your virtual phone. It's not. It's not a real phone. You see the point, okay? So, mm-hmm. what, what's your point of view about it? So when I heard about the term virtual autism, I was like, okay. When I read about it a little bit, I was like, okay, it's it's not a deflection. I think it is the definition and the terminology, right? Because autism is not just about language. I think many of us or many people think it is about language and communication. It goes beyond that, right? 
There oh. is the rigidity of routine. There is the arranging of toys in the line, right? There is the flapping of hands, right? Um, there is the anxiety comes in too, right? Um, there is also social lack of social engagement, right? Um, there are so many um, yardsticks or pinpoints when it comes to autism. It is not just about language. And I think this definition is really focused on language. And I wish they could use a different terminology for it. Maybe virtual yeah. speech delay or virtual language delay, right? And and I am still like waiting for when autism in itself is redefined, really. Um, the definition of autism, the categorization of autism. I'm waiting for when it's defined because it is such a broad spectrum that mm -hmm. it causes more conflict in the community, right? My son has these markers. The other person's child has these markers. They might not be autistic, but you cannot, sometimes people will see my son and they'll be like, uh, he was never autistic. Well, a few years ago, he was really on, um, um, he was very severe on the spectrum, depending on where, um, where he was, right? So I think I am still really, really still waiting for the clinical um, scientific community to really define, redefine what it is autism, right? What truly it is, even if they can really bucket it for us, right? Because there are a lot of people on the Asperger's um, spectrum that are considered autistic, right? And they don't want to be recovered. They don't want to be given vitamins. They don't want to be given fruits and vegetables. That is all fair enough. But there is a whole bucket of kids that need to be recovered, that need healing, that need a bi biomedical approach or that need a natural approach, whatever approach that is going to get the child to become better. So again, virtual autism, whatever it is, I think they have to redefine change the terminology so that doesn't confuse most parents, right? There's definitely the screen impact, right? But is it autism? Is it to cut, categorize it as autistic? I don't know, right? That's, that is my opinion. Mm -hmm. I kind of agree with it because I think most of the people, most of the parents, they're just focused on, oh, is my child nonverbal or is he talking? If he's talking, then it's fine. If he's headbanging, killing somebody else, I don't mind as long as he's talking. Right. Mm -hmm. Because they're only focused on speech. So speech, when right. they see my son speaking so nicely and whatnot, they're like, oh, he's just, he didn't have the issue. But he has the learning problem that's going on. And I would understand because I'm a neurodiverse myself. So he is sensitive to others. He has more different sort of compassion. He gets upset at something when my daughter or my husband would not get upset, but I would have to tell my husband like, oh, he's upset because it's the thing. And he'd be like, oh, it's the thing. It's the autism thing. Okay. It's the neurodiverse thing. So it just, it's just, it comes with the territory I understand. But the reason why we are here is to tell others, I would say, share your experience. So now the second point that we are going to discuss is your experience in working with your child, how far you have come, and maybe also throw in an, some example from your own students and your clients that you have worked with and glean some really inspiring thoughts, autism or not, severity or not, nonverbal or not. Do not go for the labels, work on the child. So what's your thought about it, Anna? Share um, your experience. So much to say about that. So much to say. Um, you know, my son does. I mean, he's um six. Mm -hmm. He got diagnosed when he was two and a half. No, he just before he turned three. Um, and I think you know, just before that, I think you know, the year before, you kind of knew that something was up. I mean, it wasn't like. You know, it was it was speech for him, but because we've got two languages, you know, you start thinking like, oh, we've got two languages. Everyone was saying that's why, you know, he's, you know, mm -hmm. classic. And then time goes on. And and then, you know, there was like classic, you know, 18 month, two year gap when he kind of just really changed really quickly. You know, sleep, not sleeping, up at night, night terrors, um, you know, in like complete inability to regulate, you know, tantrums, you know, it just kind of intensifies. I mean, we all had kind of similar stories. Um, and then it just kind of went a little bit, you know, pear-shaped from there, really. Um, 
he doesn't really have you know a level I, he's diagnosed by a pediatrician um mm-hmm. an integrated pediatrician actually but um you know you can I, I just never had the um, um I just didn't need it to get him diagnosed more because for me it was just like okay I've had one doctor who's diagnosed him I don't need to get him on the level I don't need to know who he is we could mm-hmm. still get you know at that time we're still in Australia you get also you know support from the government that I'm currently not only really using for brain mm-hmm. balance primitive reflex work because it's expensive um and kind of started you know I was obviously a practitioner at the time so I already started you know gluten dairy free even before he got his diagnosis. so we did have a pretty good you know we had a pretty good diet we had a pretty good um base to work on so it wasn't like going from an absolute you know for us it was just more like really making sure we're gluten dairy free you know working on expanding the diet and then sort of really uncovering you know what's going on in his gut you know working on picky eating like that for us was the kind of like the core of the work and just really um expanding his diet and you know working on his microbiome and you know we had things like all the kids does you know yeast overgrowth and anxiety and all that kind of stuff you know and heavy metal toxicities and um super high copper and methylation you know things like they all have pretty much so and you know um it's fun when you look back at it because I never thought about it but um you know he's doing anxiety is like not really there anymore you know sleep as we all know you know sleep is the thing that kind of gets better first so sleep isn't an issue for us anymore um it really is just now you know working on social interaction and you know initiating play and you know things like just like those social things that just I find kind of comes last in a way and that takes you know longer to build on it's not going to take a week to work on that and you know we've got a really good foundation on a diet and pig eating but you know we're still working on things you know in some foods that just takes longer than some and you just got to keep working on it and find new solutions and you know it's not um yeah, you know, it's up and down. Like, you know, sometimes you feel like it goes slow. And I think it's just, yeah, remembering that it's, it's, it is a marathon, you know, boring to say, but nothing's going to happen over a month. It's not going to happen over three mm-hmm. months. I mean, I mean, yeah, you can do a lot in three months. I do have to say that for sure, definitely. But um, I think it's always going to be the long, the long game. And he's doing really well. Like, he's doing really well with speech at the moment. I started speaking, um, he started speaking Swedish with me last year. So I'm only speaking Swedish with him now. Uh, and he understands everything I say. Cause I kind of gave up on that. Cause I was like, oh, it's never going to happen. And now it's just happening. So, you know, just the fact that an autistic child can learn two languages and, and one's had, you know, severe speech delay. It's, you know, for me, it's like amazing when you think about it. And I know you have the same experience. So, I mean, you can't deny those, you know, he still has a long way to go, but you know, reciprocating languages and building on sentences and, you know, being able to function in conversation is, you know, we didn't know if we were going to get there, you know. So, you know, this, yeah, it's, yeah. That's right. What about you, Darlene and Rita? Darlene. Okay, me. Okay. I thought you said Rita. So (laughs) so for me, um, well, my son is, 13 now he was diagnosed at two and a half so I have a lot of you know some time you know that we were but initially um when I first started off it was looking at it um like most parents do as a um, one thing I wanted to resolve okay the head banging I wanted to resolve him going to a wall in his head why why was this happening you know um so I just focused on we got to stop this um but what changed for me was when I switched to looking at it as a one thing I got to address picky eating I got to address head bang I got to address um him not sleeping, to looking at it as a whole body condition. So a lot of things were out of balance with him, like off track. And when I changed my view and started looking at it, okay, I just need to focus on getting him healthier. Um, He has a lot going on. It it was overwhelming initially to to look at it everything he he that was going on all these different things you got to do this it, it gets overwhelming but when you look at it as a whole body condition and that your child is like stress like lowering stressors um that's kind of what helped me to get over the hump of being uh, the challenges that came along with trying to get him better 
So mm-hmm. once I started looking at it as in that view, um, things started happening for him. And I was, you know, seeing things disappear, symptoms disappear that were there. And that's when I knew I, I was on the right track. Um, a lot of parents have the struggle with just getting started. They don't understand how diet can play the biggest role that no one imagined. Um, doctors don't tell us that. Just change your child's diet. Stop giving them all the sugar. You'll see an improvement in behavior. Um, they don't tell us that. Take away the coloring. All of the stuff that we, we all preach and we all know about. Um, a lot of the physicians and um, practitioners are not stressing that. And um, I think the parents just understand that, that something that small could help your child get better, um, you know, will go a long way. So I just think it's, you know, for me, my son is, like I said, 13 now. He's middle school, so he's doing really, really well. A lot of the symptoms that he had is all gone. And they've been gone for a while now. But my, my goal is just to help other parents understand um, you're going to get people saying that this stuff isn't true, but it is. And it makes a difference to your child's quality of life. So that's my experience with, you know, overcoming the symptoms. Mashallah. So mm-hmm. most of us have been actually been able to overcome a lot of the things. So virtual or not, it's working. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Rita, how about you? Yeah, just to quickly add, um, whether a child is diagnosed correctly or incorrectly, the reality is, is that they need help. And just getting that diagnosis allows them to get extra support, right? Um, So Jordan, he's 13 now. Um, He never regressed. So this was just progressive. Um, He was diagnosed at the age of two. And for us, it was the beginning as like, you know, he's not speaking at all. Um, I come from an Italian background. My husband is Cantonese. So we did start introducing languages and the doctor at the time said, you know, just get him to learn English. Mm -hmm. But um, he was a severely picky eater. Um, You know, he had a lot of sensory issues. He didn't point, made no eye contact. Like speech was a big problem you know, lined up the toys, played with them inappropriately, didn't understand pretend play. Uh, You know, he had that rigidity and unpredictability. Um, He basically had a bit of everything. Um, I was a health coach at the time, a weight loss coach at the time. And I would always make these great meals for me. And then uh, Jordan had his blonde foods, like they had to be the same all the time. And then I would have, I would make foods for the rest of my family, my son and my husband. Uh, But it was only when I got introduced to my new chiropractor, who was a functional medicine practitioner. uh, It was only then when she said, okay, you know, um, let's do some functional lab tests to understand exactly specifically what's going on with his gut. Um, let's focus on finding those imbalances. Um, and when we did, she said, well, you know, you need to change his diet. So Jordan was only eating like maybe three foods. And then the rest was all processed packaged. I was that mom that would wait for the flyers every week because I would buy fish crackers and, um, like I would say like a box of fish crackers, the rainbow ones were the most exciting ones, <laughs> right? but you know, the mini Oreos, the mini chips, Ahoy, anything to fill him up because he really wasn't eating well. So when she said, you know, you need to change his diet, I said, I can't do that. Like he's a picky eater. Um, so that was already one struggle that we had to, but thankfully when I was in the treatment program, they really helped Jordan with these strategies and tools to start introducing him to new food. So he was taught, I was taught. So I go, you know what, I know how to do this. So I started changing his diet. Um, And then through functional lab tests, I was able to understand, okay, you know, here are his imbalances. This is what we need to focus on. Um, I wanted to add though, Jordan heavily used the iPad. I encouraged it because that's how he actually learned how to speak. Um, Jordan needed to be taught how to pronunciate words, syllables, like really basics to the basics. Um, And that's what got me into um, getting into the functional medicine space, because I knew through nutrition and uncovering those hidden stressors that are causing these behaviors and symptoms, your children, your, you know, our children can get better. Uh, Jordan is so much better, but he's, 
I don't like saying he's weird, but he's just different. Like his brain is just wired differently. Um, like he he's great in math. Like he has these great uh, strengths, but still very rigid when he meets people or doesn't has no feelings. And he admits that now. Um, and I just, I guess, I, I don't feel that I can do much more for him anymore because he's just wired that way, right? Um, it was recommended that he be in an autism class starting grade one, but my husband and I uh, pushed for mainstream class uh, only because the school board here in Toronto um, they really weren't focusing on integration. And for us, we were thinking about long-term, how is he going to cope as an adult? He needs to be exposed. So all these years we've been trying and helping him, you know, desensitize, um, you know, eating better foods. Like he understands how his body feels, how his mind feels when he eats gluten. Um, and that's what I do now to help other families. Um, we focus on nutrition uh, we focus on lifestyle, you know, it's not just the foods that we're eating, but you know, what are we putting on our skin? What are we breathing? Um, there's many factors that I take into consideration when I'm helping, um, not just the child, it's really to educate the families as well, because if it's going to benefit the child, it's going to benefit the whole family. Um, yeah. And with the families that I'm working with, like number one, as soon as we change nutrition, you know, they start seeing changes in their child, even like less constipation, more clarity, um, uncovering those stressors through functional lab tests. Um, I'm able to specifically address, um, those issues, um, that are affecting, uh, the child. I had a family reach out because their child was diagnosed with Lyme. Um, and I helped them, but I didn't even address the line, right? So they had Bartonella, but Bartonella is a cofactor, and we just focused on nutrition and lifestyle. And this child no longer has the symptoms of Lyme. Like we all have Lyme, whether it's activated or not, but I don't really specifically go to, like if someone comes to me, my child has autism, can you help me with their autism? I'm going to help your child bring balance back, but I don't focus on the label, whatever they come with. It's like, let's all focus on nutrition, lifestyle, and uncovering those hidden stressors. Mm -hmm. I have a piggybacking question, which I was very much interested. So you are a health coach. You were a health coach. So I so was, uh, yeah. So I was a nutrition coach. Now I'm a functional diagnostic nutrition practitioner. So right. it's an in between a functional nutritionist and a functional medicine practitioner. Now, right. um, for your audience, um, I, I just wanted to say, don't get hung up on the initials behind someone's name, because, you know, yeah. I can't have the title of functional medicine doctor because I didn't, I don't have a degree in science which will allow me to take a functional medicine certification with the Functional Medicine Institute, right? But you can actually help more better than maybe- uh... A thousand percent, a thousand percent. So I tell families, don't get focused on like uh, a doctor because I would say 90% of the doctors in this functional medicine space are not medical doctors. They're a doctor of chiropractor, they're a doctor of physiotherapy, they're a doctor of OT, they all had to take the same certification that I took or whatever certifications you've all taken. Um, you know, even naturopathic doctors, the same thing. Again, no disrespect to anyone, but I have, I've had like maybe four or five families come to me asking for help because their naturopathic doctor gave their child B12 injections. And I'm not saying there's no space for it, but you don't definitely don't start with these injections, like focus mm -hmm. on the foundations, you know, focus mm -hmm. on the food, focus on, you know, is your child pooping well? Those yeah. are what you need to focus on. Everything else can come afterwards. Right. Since mm -hmm. it came up, I want to, I want to reiterate as well, because I have some people come in like their natural path gave them uh, B12 injection. So there was this one woman, she was like, what do I do? Should I take the injection? I was like, nope. 
you have to focus and start with the basics. And then she was like, okay, I have stopped that. I'm not going to do it. What are your all, like everybody, you can come off mute and then share a little bit. Like, what are your point of view on over supplementation? Because I think it's very rampant in our community, like over supplementation, take a child, get that, you know, get tested. What are the lackings and then slam on one <laughs> one supplement after another after another what would you say about it natalie um i think like, i think everybody knows my opinion on <laughs> it's like one of my things that i talk about all the time no i think that again like there's a time like i could i could pretend like i can talk about supplements until people take supplements but i don't because if they come into the program that i have and they're on supplements i always what i do actually is take a lot of time um, to actually match up all the foods that would actually potentially match that supplement. And then not mm -hmm. only that, it will help them detox, it will help their liver, it will help their feed their microbiome. Mm -hmm. And I said, your supplement is basically just a clone or a herb mm -hmm. or a portion of a herb that is not in its full form. And so it's not multidimensional. So my thoughts on supplements is sometimes though they do need the gaps, right? Like they have these huge holy, holy gaps. There's maybe three that I see people come in where I'm like, okay, well maybe keep those ones and, and we can work on getting them. But the point is just generally to build the foundations and always as quickly as possible to, in my opinion, remove them because they're just supposed to supplement a gap for a short mm -hmm. period of time. So okay. I, I have about five people that have come in though with like, the exact words and I get chills every time I I say it is like I could supplement an army an entire yeah. <laughs> with what I have right now and I'm just like yeah. okay. I mm -hmm. guess like hours of like matching up foods to do today right. <laughs> exactly what was your experience with your child how much have you ever able to recover gain back so I've always been, because I was in healthcare, my terminology is a little bit different. I've always talked about more of a remission base because that's what I know. And because my son was so severe, like he was the most severe of the most severe. Like he was like, when we did the check marks for the, his assessments, when he went to see his physicians, he was completely not even conversation, not even conversational, but not even able to answer to his own name. He lived in a bubble and he could not. Now I'm going to tell you guys something like my dad and I love him don't get me wrong but like my dad would because he was such a picky eater he would take him to McDonald's for breakfast lunch and dinner mm -hmm. so my son was exposed to a lot of toxicity and I knew that um as soon as I, and I came from a third generation of healthcare workers who were not healthy we know that healthcare if you look at a lot of the physicians a lot they're burnt out they're eating fast food there's pizza every single night in emerge okay. and, right after the <laughs> I can smell smoke on their body when I'm going for my, you know, checkups. Yeah, so I came and I used to be a smoker. I was a heavy drinker. I am a prime example of not being in the healthcare or like not being in the actual lifestyle area before learning about autism. This is like, I was like, like, like birth by fire here. Sorry, you're either going to do this or you're not because otherwise it was an all or nothing um, or I would not have succeeded in anything that we would have done. So for to keep it very short is my son came in at five and a half, fully nonverbal, unable to like when you scored him out of five, five being the most severe, like institutionalization was talked about. There were many different um, things that made my heart and my need because it was my first child as well. I'm only child at the time. It lit a fire in me that was, I think, in, in many ways, very good for me and made me take action. So I decided very quickly what I was going to do as soon as I learned that nutrition and the mic, as soon as I learned about the microbiome, I was like, okay, I'm sold. I understand there's something here. Um, I didn't want to do restriction because number one, my son was already so picky. His favorite foods as like, I heard a lot of you guys were like three foods, chicken mm -hmm. nuggets, french fries, and grilled cheese. That was his three foods. That's all he ate. Um, and now he eats everything under the sun. So five and a half, fully nonverbal, seven and a half, released from all care, all wow. special all everything he no longer he actually does not have a diagnosis at this point and for the social aspect of it he is very social my son has a very interesting group of friends he I would say that he is wired differently though because he he's very social like he's almost I don't want to say over social but he like 
like he will be the person who come into a room and he's like the butterfly but he wasn't like that before and he likes people who are not just academically smart he also likes to play like D and Dungeons and Dragons and he but he also loves sports so he's like a little bit in everything mm-hmm. so I think, I think right now to me I just keep going the way that I'm going um, because he also understands so my son is 14 now right so I mean I like to say that by seven and a half he was released from all care he was not at like what we would have called full remission at that point he was just very independent conversational and where many parents would have been very happy, but we just kept going. I started to educate him. He's very interested in his health. And that has made a, it has made a big difference. He is so interested. And so if he starts to get a little, he's the only one in the family who never gets anything, knock on wood, like his COVID last, like, you know, <laughs> 30 minutes of a stuffy nose. But at the mm-hmm. same time, I like I had to, I have to educate him on how to cook now. But he's interested. I think that getting our kids to that point where they care is a huge okay. thing. And he knows right away, like if he's starting to get a little bit sick, he's like, no, I'm going to have a salad. I'm going to have some chicken. I'm going to have this. He has a very good understanding of health and his body. And because I did not know a lot about health and I had to cram it all in in such a short period of time, I took a lot of action because it wasn't for me. It was for him. And I think now I'm catching up to that. Because I think we burn out a little bit as autism moms, right? Like we get really tired. <laughs> we're like, it's all you. It's, it's all you. Um, so it's interesting because now I'm just starting to implement those things for myself. But yeah, so to put it in perspective, that's where we are in the program that I teach. Um, so far, we've got families that are becoming fully verbal very quickly, usually within about six months to a year. Some take, like we say, a little bit longer. Uh, but for the most part, because I had such a, a severe child, that tends to be the kind of mom that I attract. And mm-hmm. so I enjoy that because I can like I can help them in a way that also helps their mental health. Right. Because mm-hmm. it's really hard when you have someone who can't even interact with anyone around them. Totally. Totally. Wow. I'm actually writing down points which we're going to share at the end so that they get our, you know, People can get some ideas on what to start with and how to go. So last but not the least, Wes, what was your yeah, experience? I have, a, I have a hard to stop, actually. I just wanted to yeah. have this last comment and then I can excuse myself. So for my, my son particularly, he was diagnosed at two, a little over two years old. And I give the neurological pediatrician credit because literally she wrote in after she's diagnosed him, level two, I think, and apparently is... Uh, mid severe to severe after she's diagnosed him she literally said do not give him diet do not give him stop the processed food you know she and because I think her son is also on the spectrum and she's been down the road you know so she literally prescribed this but guess what I didn't listen to her um I wish I had you know um but I went on giving him all those dyes and like everybody else my son had three foods like he loves um Dunkin Donuts was his favorite we always go there and his doctor was like keep giving it to him that's what he wants to eat just give him you know um and whole milk and then fries those three foods were his main foods right uh my son I would consider was very severe um he was nonverbal until four and I would say four and a half because after I'm looking back and um, looking at videos and stuff like that, even at five, right, he was still, he was verbal, but very rigid and very equalalia and a lot of steaming and a lot of humming, you know. Um, my son um, had a lot of silent seizures, literally, um, where the cost of spells, he, he wouldn't respond to nothing. He can stay into space um, hours if you allow him to do that. Um, I say, I say that he, um, but one thing about him that I loved even as a child was that he was not afraid. But now I know he was eloping. Like he can just go anywhere, you know, just he doesn't care. But it's part, it's all part of the brain imbalance, you know, as um, uh, when I began my research into this whole phenomenon. Um, so I started recovering my son, right? Um, healing him. And what one thing. Yeah. What? So, um, you, your, he, your doctor I told you not to do something, but you kept on. What made you decide? So, 
I was just exhausted because he was not sleeping. He was averaging four hours of sleep a night, right? He had a lot of night terrors, right? He had, it was like a clock whack. And we took him to the doctor. He goes, it's going to pass. I'm like, I don't think so because he's been doing this for so long. I'm exhausted. I can't help it. And so I went on a Facebook group and this is, wasn't a holistic Facebook group or, or t it was an autistic Facebook group, but they were focusing more on interest-based learning. And so in that group was when I was like, I am a faster. My son is not sleeping. I need help. And apparently that is a taboo in that group because you can't talk about um, the negative, the quote unquote, the problems with your child on on a, on, a, on a spectrum, they only focus on the positives of the spectrum. And so I had this angel DM me and she goes, no, your child really is sick, he needs help. And then she started walking me through and introducing me to this world. Um, and then the first day I gave him detox bath, he slept like a baby. I thought he was, he was dead because I would wake up trying to tap him to make sure that he's awake. He is like breathing really. And he slept the whole night. And I was like, what? I, I just got hooked, you know? And I am from a finance background and data analysis background, right? I really support my my company a lot with, I'm just taking data and using that um, to make more money for them. And so even though this is more biomedical, I started taking data on my child, right? Um, and then in Facebook groups, I would look at people, um, commenting or talking about their child and the recovery and in, the, in the holistic Facebook groups, there are a lot of naturopath doctors, there are a lot of uh, mothers who have um, also helped their children. And I would take down, I would take the history and really start looking at how they are um, healing their children. And so break by break, um, as I'm researching and coming into contact with several doctors, including gut doctors, you know, um, gut specialists and detox specialists, I started, I got into this world from finance into uh, this world of um, functional medicine or holistic health. And then it, it, my son just took off, right? Applying all that I'm applying. And then he took off. And after that, I was like, okay, I can help people. And who are the people that need help? Those in my country, because I'm originally from Ghana, right? And so, and this was not, it's not talked about in those countries, right? And so I decided to begin from there to really start putting that information there. And we've been, we've really done a lot of work in our community, um, parents that come to us, they start to see a change, like myself. I saw a change in one night. Again, the change doesn't have to be language and speech in one night. The change will come from the underlying imbalances. Those changes will be the, the break by break building to the language or to the socialization, right? Um, my son is doing very, very well. Um, he's a very social butterfly like Natalie. Um, son, um, he likes to talk a lot. I get tired of him talking. You know, sometimes I have to tell him <laughs> enough is enough. Um, <laughs> he likes to engage. <laughs> he likes to engage in a specific topics, right? But he is becoming more open to engaging in other topics that is not within his interest, right? Um, but has he recovered? I say, yes, right? When I give him gluten, will he gonna go back? When I start giving him the, um, um, toxins, when I start, yes, he will. It is just, it is, it is what it, it is. That's what it is, right? Um, because the brain has been wired from birth, right? So it's just to keep the brain that balanced. But once, if you start giving your children, because I get families asking me, uh, is my child going to keep this lifestyle for the rest of your life. Right? Do I have to do I it said, all? <laughs> <laughs> I yeah. said, I don't blame you. It's in the conditioning that you eating healthy food, your child eating, going on a healthy lifestyle. It is the alternative. It is in the condition. It is part of the societal programming. So we are considering this as the alternative when it should really be the mainstream versus the alternative. So now your child shouldn't go back to eating toxins. No, your child shouldn't um, go <laughs> go back to eating gluten. If again, his, their gut is not um, up for it. But my son can tolerate some gluten, especially when we're on vacation. He can tolerate it. But if there is a tipping point, if he goes overboard, 
Yeah. He's going to start to grind his teeth. He's going to start to um, behave in a certain way. So I said, I just have to keep um, going. And it is our lifestyle. There's nothing I can do about it. That is what has resulted to him um, as a, um, in this positive recovery. So we will just keep going. We are not going to go back. <laughs> Oh, wow. So we have had a lot of virtual autism kids then. <laughs> um, well, <laughs> I wish it was virtual autism because like I'm with a child. My child, iPad um, technology has been very crucial to my son. Um, and I can't underestimate it, right? I can't deny it. It has been a critical learning, social building tool for him, right? Parents are like, my child is always on the um, um, iPad, on the phone, and they are not doing anything. There is a lot that is happening when the child is on the iPad, depending on what you're doing, right? So I, you have to use the tools that technology can give your child. Use it to benefit your child, not just maybe watching whatever on tv right so I'm, I'm gonna say a program like dharma right my son uses dharma and social um stories that he create whatever I, I don't know even if people like him or not but i know even that program he watching it um, and learning a lot of social nuances he's picked up a lot that we didn't have to teach him right so um it is a necessary evil um he's learned a lot of um social um nuances that myself or his team wouldn't be able to teach him from technology so it can help but you just have to strike the balance we are outdoor see people we love nature right nature really has been you know, another, another critical um pivotal um tool for us so we have to strike. We have to strike a balance. Um, but I wish it was virtual autism. It was that easy, just to take the iPads away and for him to get healed. But it is really not. Um, thank you, thank you all. I have to get going because I have another meeting. Um, I appreciate you all. I respect all of you. Let's keep on the work. Um, regardless of whatever anybody says, we'll just keep on the work because even helping one family is one too many. Inshallah. Thank, Thank, you. You so Bye -bye. Thank you so much. Bye. It was very nice having you. And thanks to her for bringing up the issue. I want to bring it as well. You know, fear of regression because it sometimes st keeps people stuck. They're like, oh, he's going to regress back. What's the point of working on the child and whatnot? Right. So thanks to her. So as a recap, I would say, like, let's wrap up because we have been here for like an hour. So, so far we have had so many nice informations from you all, because I can keep on just my point of view, then Natalie and Rita and Darlene and you know, you all, but the few things that we have all pretty much shared were number one, we have to start with a good base of diet and nutrition. Number two was to work on the lifestyle because that is just goes hand in hand. There is no point of changing one thing, just the diet, if the lifestyle is not there to support the, you know, moving forward. And then to the third thing that came out was to treat or to look at the whole situation as a complete body disorder, not just, you know, speech or some other delays. The other thing that came up was it's a marathon, as in a long race not a short one because a lot of the times our parents we ourselves get burned out as well right we have our own tools that we teach our students and our clients and whatnot as a wrap up what would you tell to those parents i would go one by one who's on the cusp of burnout and then they're like they want to give up they're like okay i tried x y and z and they might think they have tried everything but we know that staying consistent in the long run definitely helps. Definitely helps, right? For, for example, I have worked with so far like 83 people. And Alhamdulillah, for all of them, I would say I have seen at least 50% improvement. For more than 91%, there was like 80% improvement. But there will be improvement as you can, you know, stick to. So how would you, you know, inspire them, Anna? Not to I think up. for me, <clears throat> something that was very important on our journey was, because um, I've always been very much of a perfectionist, 
and um, understanding that, you know, there's so many things to do on this journey. And even being a practitioner, you almost know sometimes too much. So, you know, you know where to get the information. I have all the information, but sometimes just understand that maybe I just need to pull back a little bit. It doesn't mean that you stop doing what you're doing, but maybe you're doing less, you know. I just need to maybe, uh, you know, reel everything in a little bit, look after myself, you know, maybe resting a little bit, just having, instead of, you know, doing stuff on the weekends, just have quiet weekends together and just rest. Like, cause I find like the times where I will get really burned out and tired, I would just get angry and annoyed and it would reflect into my son and then it reflects into his behavior. Um, and also I would just get stressed about, you know, everything. Oh, I need to cook, I need to plan recipes, I need to shop, I need to do this, I need to have a special, you know, everything. So um, just really prioritizing me and understanding that my wellness and my sort of nervous system health really impacts their well-being as well. You know, there is definitely that spiritual connection. And, you know, doing less doesn't mean you're stopping. It just meaning you just, you know, just doing less and that's okay. And you're not stopping. You're just reeling it in a little bit. And then, yeah, just giving yourself a break. You know, there's not, nothing, you know, nothing wrong with doing that. And, uh, you know, like I said, because it is a marathon, you can't just keep sprinting the entire time, which is not going to work. So that has been a really, really important uh, part of our journey. And for me to really realizing that nothing's going to be perfect, you know, uh, just finding that balance, uh, just to take a breath and then just, you know, keep on going. Thank you so much, Darlene. Yes. Okay. So for me, I'm kind of picking backing off of Anna, taking breaks and all of that. I really believe in prioritization. Um, one thing that I think a lot of parents do is they look at all of this stuff. I mean, they follow so many different people and they see all this oh, stuff yeah. and all of this stuff gets in their head and they feel like they have to do all of it at one time. It becomes like overload. Um, so what I believe in is prioritization. I believe in taking small steps, incremental approaches. Um, don't look at everything as a whole. Focus on one thing at a time. Um, take small steps. Let's work on one thing. Let's not look at the other stuff right now. I'm focusing on this one thing. Let's focus on this. Do it. Move on to something else. Once you got that down pat, move to the next step. I'm really big in taking small chunks of things and trying to, instead of make it a lot and make it overwhelming, break it down because this is a lot. I mean, it's a lot for parents to say, I can no longer go to McDonald's drive through You know, it's a lot. I mean, that was a lot for me. I couldn't go to Wendy's anymore. And I'm like, oh my God, what am I going to do? You become stressed and overwhelmed because you can't do some of the things that you're, you, you're used to doing and you feel like, you, you know, it. you enjoy it. Yes, <laughs> exactly. So I just really believe in taking that incremental approach because other than that, parents, they do give up. A lot of parents, they don't have people there with them that can help their kid. Like they don't have family around. Um, yeah. I was one that didn't have family around when my son was at his worst. So you become stressed. So you have to work, find someone that can help give you a break. We need to take breaks as well. So just that's my view on, you know, not giving up is you got to set yourself up for success. If not, you will want to give up. And that's my goal is to try to get parents to not give up because I know that once you give up, you won't win. You don't you don't get to the end with giving up. So, yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Mashallah. How about you, Rita? You came a long way with your son. You're muted. Thank you. Thank you and thank you. Um, so a few things. Um, I think more importantly, or the most important is parents that are looking for a practitioner, find someone who understands your situation. And what I mean by that, um, there's so many practitioners in the space. There's so many uh, practitioners that are going to focus on nutrition. There's practitioners that are going to focus on lifestyle and, you know, functional lab tests. We can all explain about nutrition. You know, so many people can interpret functional lab tests and provide protocols. But if your child has... Um, you know, has been diagnosed with autism, it's totally different. You need to under, you, you need to have a child with autism to understand how you can help a family with autism. It's just totally different. Yeah. Um, number two is unfortunately, there's a lot of fake people on social media these days. 
Yes. Um, don't focus on, uh, so these are two people that are going to be watching. So uh, don't focus on a cookie cutter program because every child is different. And don't yeah. focus on how many followers someone has. Uh, oh my God. Thank you so much. I know, I know many, I, I would say a handful of practitioners, sadly, that have bought their followers. And it makes me sad because they're no longer genuine. They're doing it for the money and it shouldn't be, it shouldn't be about the money. Yeah. You know, we all need to make a living a thousand percent, but don't be focused on, okay, you know, I only have 6,000, but this one has 25,000. Um, numbers don't mean anything. So you need to follow your gut. And I tell parents all the time when they come with me, like when they, you know, have a discovery call with me at the end, I always say, no pressure, go do your, um, you know, go shopping, you know, go have calls with other practitioners and see how you feel, right? Because you're going to find someone that you connect with and not that you're not sure with, but you feel pressured. And then you're going to start going to another practitioner asking questions of what that practitioner um, has recommended. Mm -hmm. And our journey is not perfect. Give yourself grace. Your days aren't going to be perfect. Sometimes, yeah, like everyone said, you need time for yourself. So, you know, let your child, you're not going to be able to give them the best foods all the time, but be mindful, you know, like you're taking a step forward, but you may be taking two steps back and that's okay. Just know where you are in that time. I personally remember, Natalie, I personally had to make a video saying that the reason why I don't have to give up. <laughs> it goes with the I remember that. Yeah. yeah. The people will find you. Yeah. Yeah. They will DM me. Like, you know, yeah. I found this other person. She has like 20, 20, 22. And then, um, you know, a lot of the things that you were saying matches with her. You were copying her. And I was like, who are you talking about? Yeah. I don't even know that person. Like, why do you think it has to be that way? Why do you think a mother, like for me, I had two, uh, I had two um, cousins on the spectrum and I have seen them, their life, how they were, how much tortured they were because people wouldn't understand them. Okay. I saw them from my own perspective and I myself had a lot of trouble when I was young as well. So that was my reason why I felt the rocket up my ass that I need to go on, go on and go on and not give up so not everybody's journey is same and categorizing somebody based on how many followers they have is so wrong <laughs> so and weird. we're all for sharing the information like it's not like if i post something about i i don't know like natalie i'm just thinking about uh, about a supplement that you can get from food it's not like oh i speak about that and then that is going to say oh well you took that from me no like not only learn that from somewhere, like we're all getting the same information. It's just at exactly. the end who that person feel comes feels comfortable with working with. Because it's all about human body. I said the same yeah. thing. Like just because your child is neuro neurodiverse doesn't mean he is from Mars, that he needs different vitamins and minerals that doesn't exist in the world and exist in you know chicken nuggets and whatnot. It's yeah. we all have the same liver, kidneys, everything. So we will give you all the similar information. It's about whether you feel comfortable. For example, me, I wear hijab. I'm a Muslim and I am from Southeast Asia. So people from India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, they feel comfortable with me. Yeah. Not a person from Sydney, you know, or, or UK and whatnot. Yeah. So that, that's their point of view. And one of the things, one of my students actually asked me, like DM me, Apu, you are bringing in so many of your competitors aren't you feeling nervous i'm like they are not my competitors <laughs> like, how are you saying that i was like because we are not each in just one pool we have like 70 80 million neurodiverse kids in the world if i work on just 1000 i will be burned out <laughs> so yeah. we are not fighting for each other we are the reason why we are here is we are bringing on the same information all of us pretty much saying the same thing which makes it more solid makes the thing more powerful that you have to work on your gut work on the you know biomedical system work on the lifestyle and whatnot so natalie 
let's wrap up with you then. So I'll, I'll definitely say that there is a second hit theory. My business partner always talks about it. If you've never heard it, it's that for a new mom who's just never heard that they can have better outcomes with their child, mm -hmm. then the first person to say it is never enough. You have to have that second person to back it up. And on yeah. top of that, we need as humans, because we're habit driven, to be told something many different ways for it to actually hit home. And I think that that's the beauty of being with people, because we understand that some of our kids, when they're especially severe, they're suffering. Like yeah. many of them are, are not able to communicate and they want to, and they want to have, you know, they do want independence. My son is like, I could see it when he tells me, of course, like I wouldn't, I couldn't imagine it if I couldn't communicate. And the truth is, is that if we can give that to any child, it doesn't matter who they work with, so long as they can get to that independence. But anyways. Yeah. My advice, I guess, from, I guess it's coming from a scarcity mindset, the way we are taught, like there's always less, you have to fight for it. Oh, I always tell people I will never not have work. And I hope that one day I don't. Yeah. But anyways, not, not saying that for, to answer the question very clearly, because I actually do a training exactly on this, because a lot of it is mindset. If you are the spaghetti thrower and you are burnt out and you have thrown the kitchen sink at autism. The truth is likely you actually did too much. Like all these moms have said too, all at once. And the truth is there is like such a simple process that I like to teach people at the beginning, which is very similar to doing the small steps, taking one action. It's like decide on the one process. Then you take imperfect action towards it, but you do it slowly. And then the thing that everybody that I see that gets stuck does not do is evaluate what they've done. And so they continue to throw the spaghetti and so what ends up happening is if you can evaluate your processes, you can make minor changes in the right direction that might meet your individual life. So that's my advice. It's very simple, but it's what's worked for all the families in the program. And I think it's just the easiest thing and simple is best, sustainable is best. Totally, totally, totally. Oh my God. Thank you so, so much, everybody. We have had, I would like to go on and on, but I think our people would get burnout but just by listening to all of this thing we have had a lot of information but we are going to be staying in the group inshallah and maybe once in a while we will bring some other topic which is as interesting for all of us and then we can have a shedding on light thing for it how would that be would you be interested inshallah thank you so so much i will leave all your social links in the post so that anybody who's watching this can come to your you know your platform and give you a follow or even join your program because we are all here for the betterment of the community okay thank you so so much it was very very nice meeting you all bye. i'll say goodbye now bye bye everybody bye.